Ja, herzlich willkommen, liebe Zuhörer. Ähm, schön, dass welcome, Sie alle da sind. Dear listeners, I'm quite happy that you all joined us. My name is Christiane Grefe. I'm a journalist with a focus on globalization, ecology and sustainability. And I've got the honor to organize or to, to host today's um, webinar of the Heinrich Böll Foundation on genetic engineering. I think you've already noticed that this event is being interpreted simultaneously into French and English. So it's very important that you choose the right channel in order to be able to listen to your respective language. There's this globe at the bottom and there you can find all the available languages so that you can follow uh, and listen to everything. Our topic today is the regulation of modern biotechnologies. So in concrete terms, it's about a new genetic engineering a technology called gene drives. Researchers working in this field hope for great advances for the medical treatment, for sustainable agriculture and also nature conservation. However, critics say that these gene drives change the basic rules of evolution because the traits that are being introduced in species are being passed on to the next generations. And this sounds like something fancy, but it allows for extensive um, infringements of uh, humans um, in nature. Everything is being discussed at a basic level, at the national level and in Europe in particular in the framework of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD. Um, a conference was to be take place in autumn this year, however, it was um, transferred to next spring due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so in Kuanming, um, uh, the conference will take place um, and we will deal with this topic now. Everyone involved here knows that this is actually the second event in a series of online webinars um, as a countdown uh, event uh, to the CBD with the title um, Nature Under a Battle, so to speak. And in the first uh, Part, which took place on September the 21st, we had high-ranking representatives uh, as panelists from the German Development Ministry, as well as the General Secretariat from the CBD, and they uh, talked to us about the conference, and it became quite clear that uh, Corona actually had a major impact on the negotiations, and that a huge problem is to make sure that uh, participants from the Global South can uh, take part in the negotiations. There will be two further events and I will give you the dates uh, at the end of this event today. So today we will talk about gene drives and not, not least due to the Nobel Prize of Medicine uh, to Jennifer Dunner and Emmanuel Charpentier for the CRISPR-Cas. Um, technology has become more and more important because uh, also with gene drives, this type of gene editing plays a major role. We have very interesting guests, the molecular biologist and geneticist Ricarda Steinbrecher is on the panel today and the human rights and environmental activist Ali Tapsoba from Burkina Faso joins us. The health expert Andreas Wolf and also Mareike Imken from the campaign Stop Gene Drive. And I will give you more details on them later on. But uh, right now, I would briefly give you an overview of our today's agenda. At the beginning, we will have a virtual panel and we will listen to short input statements and have a brief discussion. And I would like to ask you, dear audience, to uh, be patient for approximately 45 hours in order to listen, uh, 45 minutes uh, to, to listen to the panelists. And I would like to ask you to only ask very specific questions if something has been unclear, for example. But at the begin uh, at the end, um, of course, you can also participate in the Q and A. And if you wish to do so, so please use the tool for Q and A. So, and your questions will be collected and then. Um, 
we will uh, ask them on the panel. So I like to apologize for taking a look at my smartphone from time to time. But this allows me to take a look at the questions that you raise. So in the Q&A tool, you can raise your questions uh, and not in the chat function. However, the chat function can be used for a mutual exchange, for uh, discussions, and here you can also post additional information. And this will also be done uh, by the Heinrich Böll Foundation and um, their partners. A final remark, we would like to know who joins us today, so we would kindly ask you to answer a little survey if you like. There will uh, soon, in a minute, there will be um, different uh, image, different window on your screen, and there you can answer the questions. I mean, we cannot meet face to face, unfortunately, so we do not know who joins us. So this uh, little window will remain open for a certain period of time. And in the course of the discussion, you will also be able to see what the results of this little survey are and who participates. Now I have a talk to, uh, extensively, actually. And um, now I would like to come to today's topics. And first of all, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Ricarda Steinbrecher. She is, as I already mentioned, a molecular biologist and geneticist. She is also co-founder and board member of the European Network of Scientists for Social and Environmental Responsibility. And she's also a long-term member of different expert groups of the Biodiversity Convention and also an expert for risk assessment. Ms. Steinbrecher joins us from Oxford today, where her research institute Econexus is located. So welcome to you, Ms. Steinbrecher. Thank you very much. So we would like to hear from you uh, more details. So first of all, I would like to ask the question, how, what uh, or how does a gene drive work? What is the qualitative difference to um, genetic engineering so far? Well, of course, uh, it's difficult to answer this in a short period of time, but you already explained that the gene drives are actually a new form or new kind of genetic engineering, which sh should allow us to genetically modify whole species or whole generations or even eliminate them and not in a confined area like in one field but actually in nature as a whole so this has a completely different dimension uh, compared with traditional conventional genetic engineering but i would like to briefly show you a slide and i have to share my screen I would like to show you a few uh, slides. Uh, and I would like to apologize. I've been living in England for quite some time now, so sometimes I don't find the right German words. Um, you already mentioned that uh, uh, the Mendel, Mendel's uh, laws say that, uh, of course, um, a certain characteristic or trait is being inherited by 50%. But if there's, for example, more stress involved or others than other aspects involved, then um, we end up with a lower percentage. So here we see 50%. So 50% of the offspring inherits the specific trait. So basically, if we have a negative trait, it will um, eventually disappear over generations. However, with gene drives, it's completely different. Here we can see that uh, even if the trait is negative for the organism itself, it is still being passed on from generation to generation. And we can see that uh, every offspring basically inherits this trait. And the idea to do this has been around for quite some time already. So um, people try to actually 
to uh, to to achieve this despite the usual uh, inheritance or genetic theory but um based on crispr cas we now have the possibility to to do this and i would like to explain this now so crispr cas uh, many of you might already uh, know about this it's a protein the cas protein which has the ability to actually cut dna and uh, here we have uh, this RNA um, section, which can try to find the target uh, DNA and attach to it. As for example, in this case, here we have uh, the DNA double strand and when it attaches and everything is right, I mean, this is just a rough sketch, but if everything is uh, correct, then this double strand break takes place here where you see this little arrow and then the DNA is cut. And this is actually all it does. This is the so-called genome editing. All the rest is being done by the organism itself. So for example, if you take a look at the next slide, I mean, this is the double strand break. And what is happening now the cell or the organism says, oh my God, my DNA is uh, cut, is broken, this might cause problems, so I have to repair it. And then there are two main possibilities, either uh, one on the left takes place where it is being reattached uh, in some way, but uh, in the meantime, the cell has um, done something here so the the result is a little bit different than the original so we have this knockout disruption and the second possibility uh, involves homology this means that the cell is trying to find something that is looking similar um, then the cell can copy that so like a template for example so here we can see it at the bottom here we have slight alterations or on the right um even a whole gene sequence can be added. So at, if at the end of the gene, we attach this kind of homology, if at this point, instead of introducing a new gene, uh, introduce the CRISPR-Cas molecule and give it the, or commission it with trying to find a specific sequence, then, it will be attached at the same point every time. And this means that, um, I mean, this, this is still undergoing a lot of research, so it doesn't work with plants very well yet. And with mammals, there have been many failures. However, with insects, uh, we are quite advanced, but I do not want to talk about the risks right now. I just want to explain what it is. So this means if uh, we have uh, this CRISPR-Cas gene, gene and have uh, introduced it here, and if it becomes active, for example, sperms or eggs are being formed, then it says, hey, go over to the other chromosome, the second chromosome, hom homologous chromosome, then we have this double strand break, then this homology is being found, then it's being introduced and suddenly I have two versions of the same thing and then only this can be uh, inherited. And of course, you can also say that it should be a gene which is important for fertility of a female. So if this is interrupted, for example, then over a certain period of time, you would only have male offspring and then the whole population might collapse. But of course, you can also introduce other traits, theoretically, and then these traits could be spread broadly within a population of a whole species. So the three things that uh, can be done with it, uh, one is uh, to eliminate things or, or something, or to alter something or replace something. So the most important thing about this, and I'd now like to exit my slides. How can I get out of this screen sharing? Okay. The most important thing is that uh, genetic engineering so far only meant that something was changed in a lab 
then it was reviewed, and then you could foresee to a certain extent what the risks might be, what kind of side effects might come up, even though, of course, not um, to 100%. But in this case, concerning gene drives, you create an organism that is being released, and then it, it passes on this uh, change in the genes to every uh, generation that comes after it. And And the organisms that were changed so far were mainly um, cultivated uh, crop where we knew the genetic structure, which were rather uniformous. Um, whereas in the environment, in, in nature, of course, the genetic is not uniform. There are so many different um, aspects involved and to make any predictions in terms of the outcome is basically impossible but that much about it thank you so right now i cannot access this okay can you miss it so i hope you can hear me now Sorry, I had a bit of a technical problem right now. So thank you very much, first of all. And just to ask the question, CRISPR is always described as the model of precision. So it is so precise, you know exactly what you're doing. And now on the contrary, you say that this is even more unpredictable. So how can we explain this contradiction? Well, maybe this has to do with the fact because that for the first time it is used in a targeted way for a specific DNA sequence. This does not mean that only what is intended is going to happen. But when you work in the lab, you can check what's actually happening. If you use this for research, you can actually just uh, split or snip out a gene and then you realize, well, it might not be working properly and you can analyze what this gene was used for. And then also researchers find out that other traits might be affected. Once you've destroyed this gene, this means that the RNA is a reduced RNA, which might still be produced. And this would be then changed into a protein, which is different. So. There is research with human cells, with uh, mice cells, and this shows that other things are happening as well. But for research, this is, of course, a great tool. So euphoria is something that is justified. But when I understood this correctly, the difference in quality with gene drives is that this is not just once put into nature, but this is something which is going to be reproduced in future generations. So who is doing some research in the field of these technologies? What is the purpose of this? Who is investing in this research? Maybe you can give us some examples. As I said, the idea of being able to do this, for instance, to eradicate pests from the overall context has been around since the 1940s, the 1920s, Yabrowski and others trying to find different methods in order to eliminate pests in uh, crop cultivation, but also when it comes to specific flies, mosquitoes, moths and others and they try to eliminate them. So the original celebrated idea of having the opportunity to release pests that before were treated with radioactive radiation, the so-called sterile insect technique, was something that was tested for seven years in the United States from 57 to 65, I believe with the so-called screwworm fly. And this is where a lot of effort was invested and then this could be eradicated for some time. 
So the idea behind this was once we are able to do this in nature, we can just release this and then it's going to happen all by itself. It's just going to drive the gene. This is where it comes from. The gene is just kind of driven into the natural environment. This then gives rise to a long list. Many in agriculture say, wow, we could use this for our little fly uh, that for instance in the united states is always attacking the cherries and oh this is also something that's happening in germany yes this is drosophila suzuki the species i'm talking about so now the idea is to modify this to engineer this so that it can no longer damage the cherries but what happens once this is also something which reaches the native country of that species or what if you eliminate that species what happens in the entire ecosystem Okay, so what could happen? Because you might always try to uh, weigh the pros and cons. You could say, well, agriculture free from pests. What could happen? What are the risks? What is it you're thinking of? Well, on the one hand, the more we consider trying to have everything as sterile as possible, no other pests, no other Uh, herbs, weeds, weeds, I think that's the word for it. So no other insects that are detrimental. So once you eliminate this, you use genetic engineering to do this. This does not mean that you have a well-balanced biotope that uses nature in order to support agriculture, but it is rather seen as an enemy. So this means that there's warfare against nature is something which is going to increase continuously. And one risk would be that the responses could be much stronger. You could develop resistance. And this is also something which we could see resistance to CRISPR. For instance, the genetically engineered mosquitoes in order to combat malaria all of a sudden developed resistance so once a snip out took place and then this was uh, put together again without having CRISPR introduced then you cannot uh, cut one more time because it is modified a little bit so you have a completely new resistance or the variability of gene sequences in the broad population of these pests could also have resistance so all of this is pushed back and it can return much stronger than it was before and CRISPR the genetic scissors are kind of introduced as well. So where else are the scissors going to be at work? So here, the entire evolution is put on shaky grounds or it's lifted to a level where we have no predictability anymore. So if I am correctly informed, you are also trying to exterminate invasive species in countries where they are not native. You also mentioned malaria. We will speak about this topic later. Who is financing this research? Is this all fundamental research, which is funded by government institutions, more or less, or companies? Who is doing this? That varies, just like with prosophila. As I mentioned, this was partly funded by those who who cultivate the cherries, for example. And speaking about the topic of mice, who were to be made extinct on islands where they have turned into pests. This is a completely different consortium that uh, is funding this here. The United States Research Project Agency in the field of defense put a lot of money into this, but also they invest in other research projects like in the Mosquito Project, also into the anti-gene drive research, because it is very clear that this type of technology 
can not only be used for peaceful purposes, it could also be used for more aggressive purposes. And then there are a lot of philanthropists that see the opportunity for them to promote their own ideas. For instance, the Bill Gates Foundation, Tata, they invest a lot of money as well. And here, there are interests as well from the side that is focusing a lot on genetic engineering. So what we are witnessing right now is that there is a certain pressure to implement this. And it is not in line with the actual risks that exist. Just because there are such major interests behind this, there is a lot of thrust behind it. Interests in cure, in disease prevention, eradicating malaria, or what do you mean? Well, this is not only malaria. We see this with IUCN at the moment. It is the International uh, Nature Conservation Organization. Oh, thank you very much. So this is where all the synthetic biology aspects are looked into. So the question is whether genetic engineering and especially gene drives should be used in nature conservation and what this actually implies. There is a lot of pressure by different interests and they want to rely more on these technologies than trying to tackle the root causes that actually led to these symptoms. So economically motivated pressure as well, if I understand you correctly, or is there a debate of ecologists versus economists, some with technology, some without? Well, what I see are a lot of financial interests. If we look at the debate that is ongoing in the context of uh, the CBD, the Convention on Biodiversity, synthetic biology in that context is very controversially discussed. And some do not want to recognize that this is something new that should be looked into because the interests of big multinationals like Monsanto, Bayer and other innovative companies also pharmaceutical companies have many interests at stake and they do not want to have new regulation introduced. They just want to have a reduction of this regulation so that you can actually use ad lib whatever you like. Yes, that's right. This is a debate which is ongoing in the context of the CBD. So maybe you could tell us what exactly is the content of that debate and what you are expecting for the spring. Yes, for all the discussions and also the expert groups that we looked into, we see that there is a, an influence that is exerted. The gene drive files were a disclosure, for example, and then we can see that Bill Gates was uh, investing 1.6 million into a PR agency. And I wrote this down because I found this was so interesting on the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation site, it says that the money went to the emergence AG in order to increase awareness, understanding and acceptance of possible gene drive applications. So they do not only want this to be understood, but also to be accepted. And there are more people now that are supposed to say everything is all right, it is just fine, we know exactly what we're doing, and the precautionary principle, which we are seeing elsewhere as well, is try to uh, be circumvented. Okay, so there is advocacy by the proponents, but there is also advocacy by the critics. So how do you see the actual situation in the CPD? Who is going to have the upper hand? Or is this still unclear? Well, if we check the precautionary principle and the CBD is also in charge of biodiversity conservation and protection, then each and every new technology needs to be looked into very, very carefully to find out whether there is a risk and uh, whether some risks might even be worsened. So the precautionary principle 
is a very essential principle. And I believe that there are some that are stronger who are in favor of that precautionary principle. But then there is a lot of pressure if people say in public, look at this malaria, we can solve this problem, but this is just a pretext to drive something completely different. And we need to look at things and how they stand. We need to really take our time to think this through. Yes, and this also depends on how much time the conference is giving to itself. Our time is limited as well. So I think that we will discuss this later on, but there is one question for clarification that comes from the chat. Somebody would like to know whether there is the risk that the traits that were introduced by gene drive are also spread to other species when this species is released, or is this very specific? That is a very good question. First of all, it can be spread into other species, like with the malaria um, mosquito. There are three or four different species as well who very often crossbreed, but then there is a different way as well, the so-called horizontal gene transfer. So it can either be inherited or there are other options of transferring the gene. We saw this quite a lot within a group of flies or from one fly to the next so that the genes are transferred. This exists because the gene drive is so small and it was copied from the elements in nature that do exactly this. So this is something which needs to be taken into consideration. Very last question. At the moment, these releases have not yet taken place and there are rules for biosafety that are intended to regulate this. What is the current situation? Well, the CBD is in charge of this. Uh, WHO looks into this as well. That is the World Health Organization, but it only looks at this from the angle of human health. But CBD is in charge of the environment. So when you analyze this, you realize that there is no specific rule on what you have to do in order to prevent impacts because those organisms don't stop at borders. They can spread globally. So how do you handle this? How do you check what could happen in a neighboring country? And how can you reach decisions together? There are no treaties on this. And this is something which we are currently trying to advocate. We have the Cartagena protocol, and it is a protocol on biosafety for trading in genetically engineered organisms. So there is a great need for regulation, absolutely. Thank you very much for the time being. And the need for regulation is also something which is important because there is one country or uh, quite a few countries where such release attempts are at least planned. This country is Burkina Faso. We just heard that there is an initiative called Target Malaria. The Bill Gates Foundation is one of the stakeholders in this. And such genetically modified and engineered malaria mosquitoes are to be tested in this country. We have Ali Tapsova with us. He is our guest. I hope that he is joining us right now and he will tell us from his perspective how all of this is perceived in his home country. So are you there, Ali Tapsova? I fear we have a problem with the connection. No, a warm welcome to you, Ali Tapsova. Let me just quickly introduce you. You are a human rights and environmental activist. And you work for an organization, Terre à Vie, and for the Collective Citoyen pour l'Agroécologie, which is a citizen's initiative for agroecology. And you looked into the gene drive and malaria mosquito issue. So maybe you could just briefly describe us the situation in Burkina Faso. So what is the current 
status of the experiment, who wants to try out experiments, and what is the status of the plans? Please tell us. First of all, let me say that in Burkina Faso, the situation is as follows. We have uh, two types of experimentation. We have uh, the genetically engineered beans. This is uh, research which is currently conducted into a crop which is uh, at the moment conducted in a confined and contained area. It is eaten a lot in our country and we believe that this is going to affect the food system and maybe also human health. The second genetically engineered organism are the mosquitoes above the project of target malaria. This is something to do with genetically engineered animals. It is the most dangerous experiment, the Target Malaria Project. Let me tell you that this started in 2012, but officially in 2016, we've received the information that eggs were imported from the Imperial College of London in order to be put into an insectarium next to where we are in order to raise those mosquitoes. And uh, all of this is situated in a research center. And, and so far they have uh, 6,000 genetically modified uh, mosquitoes and uh, they are mostly sterile males, but we were told that it is impossible to release exclusively sterile males, but that there will also be females involved. And uh, this happened in the village of Bana, and uh, this a little bit further away from the capital. And at the start, there was a controversy because in Burkina Faso, the public opinion did not at all accept why in our country this was happening so that genetically engineered species were to be released with target populations because there are people who are living there and this is going to be tested. Therefore, there was a controversial national debate. There was a big outrage everywhere on television, on the radio, on the internet. Everybody was very concerned. So the government was trying to calm down the population, but they could not. They simply wanted this project to be stopped. And we have done some advocacy work. We said this project should not be continued. When we speak about this target malaria project, May I? I just wanted to ask a brief question on the test itself, but these were not genetically engineered mosquitoes, if I am correctly informed. This was just a preparation for the GMO release in two years from now. So this was only an experimental test with mosquitoes to see how they spread, or was this already genetically modified? Yes, Target Malaria said that these were genetically engineered mosquitoes. They were not undergoing gene drive, but they were genetically engineered. They were imported from the Imperial College. These were genetically engineered egg cells that were imported, but no gene drive yet. Yes. Yeah. No. GMO mosquitoes, not gene drive. So when it comes to the approach of target malaria, let me say that this project 
has made use of the illiteracy of local communities. They could not really understand what was going on. They did not understand what genetically modified meant. And the population was just told that they were going to be helped when it comes to the fight against malaria. Also, there was corruption in the local communities. There were young people who were recruited to capture the mosquitoes. And they were giving money to the people so that they had themselves bitten by mosquitoes. And this is how the mosquitoes could be captured. And uh, this is not allowed. This kind of behavior is uh, prohibited because um, there was no informed and free consent. But this was an abuse of the population. Corruption played a role in this as well. And, uh, and Bill Gates was financing these projects. And this is why the government was simply trying to adhere to what was intended by the project, even if this was going against the wishes of the population. So I would just like to briefly say target malaria itself are saying that they did nothing without the consent of the population. So could it be the case that the village elders were not communicating very well? Maybe this was an interplay of different things, why this did not reach the communities? No, target malaria. There was no free and informed consent as it is described by the legislation. We went into the villages and we also spoke with people from the local communities. We said, what happened with the target malaria? Well, there were just representatives and the village chiefs. They were discussing the project and they would then given their consent, yes or no, but they were not representing the entire population. We went to the villages and uh, we said, we want to speak to the citizens, whether they understand everything, but they were just afraid. And we really wanted to give everybody the truth, but they were just corrupted. The village leaders were corrupted as well. And there were just uh, sheets and questionnaires that were to be filled in. And it was not told to them that these were consent forms or sheets. This was just in French and this had to be translated, but it was not translated and they just signed something. And then also we found out that the mosquitoes could just go anywhere. And we cannot just say that you just have an exchange with a small village and then this is enough because the mosquitoes, they could just fly wherever they want to fly. And they could also be spread by the wind and they could even go as far as 50 kilometers away from that village and that area. So target malaria needs to get the consent of the entire population in Burkina Faso and not just discuss with the few people who are illiterate who are in one single village. So target malaria has not received the free and informed consent. So you see this very critically and because nobody from target malaria is here with us, all I can say is that this is described differently by the organization. But you have your own experience, of course. My general question would be, malaria is a huge problem. So you always have to try and weigh risks and chances or opportunities. So why are you so skeptical when it comes to this method? And maybe you can also briefly tell us what you see as alternatives when it comes to combating malaria if this method is not used. First of all, I would like to tell you that malaria has turned into a business in Africa. The mortality rates are wrong numbers. This is only to receive money and motivate donors to give money. Once you look into the figures, you see that mortality rates because of malaria were reduced and are 
on the decline in Africa. We are very skeptical when it comes to what target malaria is trying to communicate to us because we have our own experience and we have the failed experience with the genetically engineered cotton. This was the BT cotton and we already said back then this is going to cause problems because uh, there the once these uh, GMOs cross the species barrier you can no longer handle the problems because genetically modified genes can also cause some perturbations in the species generally and uh, once the Monsanto gene was inserted the cotton no longer had the same yield and also this could no longer be sold at the international level because of its poor quality and this is why we said we do not want to have this another time we don't want to have gmos in our territory because this is going to have negative consequences the goal of target malaria at the end of the day is to also spread and disseminate gene drive organisms this is going to be a disaster Everything that was published in research tells us that this gene drive technology is not yet manageable. It is uncertain and unsafe. It has not yet been tried out anywhere else. And we thought, why don't the big countries like France, like the United States, like England, the Imperial College, why don't they release their own mosquitoes over there with them, with their students. Why do they do this over here with us? Those scientists, why don't they try to spread the gene drive organisms over there with them, then evaluate whether this is good or bad, and if it is good, then export it to us. So these are the scientific aspects, and we said that we cannot just ignore this, and we cannot allow for this to be tested with us. Thank you very much. In the interest In the interest of our very limited time, what are you hoping for from the Biodiversity Convention, what, or conference rather, what are your expectations, the conference that is going to happen next year? We hope that for one time, the conference will respect the Cartagena Protocol spirit and that it will also take precautions and respect the precautionary principle. We hope that the conference will respect what we call the will of the indigenous communities. We hope that there will be a moratorium on gene drive organisms, that this conference tells and stipulates very clearly that this is a hazardous technology, it is not manageable, it is not predictable, it is not safe, and uh, that uh, those experiments are not safe. I already told you, politically, socially, economically, culturally, the GMOs and the gene drive organisms will cause uh, uh, the transformation in the African countries, and this will also have an impact on the health systems in Africa. This will create dependencies vis-a-vis -vis multinational companies, because billions of dollars are being invested, and this will then oblige African countries to also invest money into something which is dangerous. And this is not good for our healthcare system. It's going to push it into chaos. And we also know that once, okay, once we have a GMO generation in nature, this is having an impact on the food web. Thank you very much, Ali Tapsoba, for also explaining your concerns to us. Maybe we can speak about this later on, it, time permitting. You already mentioned the healthcare system. This is a very important aspect. And very briefly, let me say, this is what I just found out. Very 
many people have not received good translation of what Ali Tapsoba was just saying. And this is why I would just like to briefly summarize. He criticized that the project target malaria in Burkina Faso was not sufficiently informing the population and he also expressed his concern that gene drives were not fully developed and this is why healthcare risks might be associated with this and he hopes that this topic <coughs> will also be <coughs> taken into account so for the next CBD. And Target Malaria says uh, we involved them, we had them participate, but by way of communication, this is something which apparently did not work out well. So far, so good. So we just touch upon the health system, which brings us uh, to our next expert, Andreas Wolf. Andreas Wolf is um, an expert in global health issues at Medico International, an international organization for international solidarity, which also works as um, an aid organization and has a diverse field of action. Um, you listen to it. Maybe you can briefly say how you think about the use of these kind of technologies like gene drives. Is this a breakthrough or what do you think? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. My impression is if I might look at it from an historic angle um, and the historic fight against malaria is uh, that so the desire to once and for all to uh, control this mosquito or this disease, then you can finally uh, end the problem of malaria is actually a desire that has long been uh, lingering um, in mankind and it's always failed. So our impression or our view uh, without being an expert for gene drive is that this hope to finally eradicate something that is uh, biologically uh, embedded in society uh, is actually not working um, usually. So for example, uh, I mean, smallpox is usually uh, um, an example that is being cited uh, as um, a pro. However, um, the decades old fight against malaria shows that it's only going to work if you continuously work together with the affected communities and societies. And if you do not only rely on a technological breakthrough like DDT wars in the past or certain um, uh, drugs, um, anti-malaria drugs, or others that are being, therapies uh, that are being uh, promoted right now. So you have to continuously uh, provide health care and also a continuous treatment. Um, do I understand you correctly that in such a scheme it might play a role or do you have basic concerns? Well, um, I, uh, I mean, we heard a lot of arguments also from Ms. Steinbrecher. They are, of course, quite relevant. Um, so by hoping to manipulate the ecosystem and be able to control it, and um, I mean, if you think that you do not have any side effects, I think this is... I mean, from our point of view, this is a major problem. And Mr. Tapsola has uh, clearly said that in the communities or in the societies, um, there's a lack of communication. It has not been done together with the local communities. I think this is a major problem um, from our point of view. So as we always have to weigh the benefits and the risk. Could you briefly describe, I mean, there are countries in which malaria uh, has not been um, eradicated, but at least uh, limited. So how could we achieve it if not with this kind of technology? Well, the interesting thing is that the major successes in the fight against malaria that were 
achieved in the 1950s and 60s uh, took place with the support of the World Health Organization and the initial results were quite remarkable. So they showed that if there is a societal and holistic approach concerning mosquito control and uh, control of the uh, age and uh, that it is possible to control the level of disease in society. And of course, this led to major successes for the concrete um, communities. And if this commitment uh, slows down, that there are so-called rebound effects, which means that um, that uh, larger uh, pandemics might appear so this might also be induced by large population movements like um, flies because of uh, wars, etc. But the countries in which it works quite well show that you have to make a continuous effort. And <clears throat> what concerns me is that um, we uh, actually put everything uh, into the implementation of one idea and we and that we think we do not have to do anything else, this might cause a major problems. I mean, this is simply wrong. And <clears throat> without being a gene drive expert, I would say that um, um, <clears throat> it's a major problem, let alone um, the possible side effects or, or detrimental effects or unexpected effects that might be there and that we do not know yet, <clears throat> which might also um, appear. Well, <clears throat> where does this feeling come from that you have? I mean, in the global health policy, you're also dealing with other topics like uh, HIV AIDS or um, lung diseases. So is this an approach or a conflict that appears time and again between the technological dreams and the... <clears throat> and the structures that uh, bet on political uh, strategies, can we put it like that? Well, I think um, it might also be a basic conviction or maybe also due to experience. <clears throat> the wish to finally overcome cancer, for example, or to find a solution um, to make diabetes a lesser problem, um, this is something that is of course understandable and of course the pharmaceutical industry is uh, conducting research for new drugs for new treatments or vaccinations <clears throat> vaccines and in particular in the debate about COVID-19 we see that despite all the investments into new vaccines people articulate quite clearly that even with a vaccine we might not reach a point where <clears throat> something like the COVID-19 pandemic is eventually over. And we have experience uh, with HIV AIDS over decades. And I mean, there's still no vaccine. And of course, we have to continuously make an effort here. And this is not going to stop suddenly. Um, it's actually an exception that you can eradicate something like smallpox uh, at one point. Um, a polio, for example, I'm not quite sure whether we'll be able to achieve this in the long run. And in terms of uh, agents that are being transmitted with vectors like mosquitoes, um, I'm not sure. So the uh, potential control that we gain is limited despite this kind of innovative technology. And I think we simply have to say that um, together with the local communities, we have to um, make a major effort. We have to cooperate with them and find local solutions. And we should not only uh, focus on this technological fix. Well, you all we already touched upon the philanthropists like um, the Bill Gates Foundation, and you also looked into this, uh, also in connection with the corona uh, pandemic. And um, there are also some uh, conspiracy theories um, around it. And I think we can simply speak of lies that are being spread over the internet, but 
There might also be some criticism that is justified. So what's you, your view on it? I mean, this foundation is spending a lot of money. Um, they have the hope um, of overcoming the pandemic, but where is actually the limit of the boundary between justified criticism and conspiracy theories and lies? How would you describe it? Well, we tend to say that the Gates Foundation is rather a symptom than the cause of a problem. It is a symptom of a world order that gives so much power to private actors, the companies and their foundations. So the actually the, the actual question is who controls their decisions, the decisions of these kind of huge corporations or the Gates Foundations, which focus on research which is actually only controlled by a small group of people, in this case, by a couple, um, Bill and Melinda Gates, <clears throat> who decide uh, to do something about malaria. And maybe in the future, they focus on a different disease. And this is actually a basic problem that we see, and as Ms. Steinbrecher has already explained, <clears throat> the problem is even bigger if such a foundation <clears throat> is not only supporting research with enormous funding and researchers become dependent on this uh, funding, but uh, there's also the, the implementation of this research via the media or other companies support this research with funding and <clears throat> they try to undermine a critical um, public. So this is actually a problem that the Gates Foundation should face up to, in addition to this very uh, technological approach that they believe that by investing in a in an advanced technological mechanism, they could um, solve these kind of health issues like a malaria. So this means that um, you have some concerns in terms of a democracy or democratic theory. Well, yes, of course, on the one hand, that's true, but the idea of the Gates Foundation, I mean, it comes from a corporate background and it obviously <clears throat> is more doubtful about uh, public health uh, structures. And is, this is actually reinforcing a certain trend. Um, so the skepticism towards public social institutions and services is something that has uh, increased over the past 10 to 20 years. And here we have to say that <clears throat> we are now experiencing this global health pandemic and now we realize how important functioning public institutions are that have the trust of the general public. I mean, if, for example, face masks need to be uh, worn or other things um, have to be implemented. And of course, the Gates Foundation is not really helpful in this regard because it only thinks into one direction, which is a vac vaccine, which is supposed to be there at the end. But um, dealing with such a pandemic, and how can we do this? How can we deal with this pandemic? And how can we um, take along all people in society? This is not being dealt with by the foundation. And the necessity to talk to people in a way that they can understand it, this is very important. And this is something that the Gates Foundation is not taking into account. And I think that this is actually a real problem. Well, it is a learning organization. That's the way it describes itself. And as we've learned a lot in the corona pandemic, this might eventually uh, um, change. But thank you very much for your um, assessment. Uh, this was a good political frame for the specific um, technology. So now we come to our last panelist. I don't see any 
uh, re specific requests. So now I would like to welcome Marike Imkin. Marike Imkin is also one of the organizers of this series, uh, event series, and she's the head of the European Stop Gene Drive campaign, and she works for the organization Save Our Seeds. So welcome to you. As the name of the campaign has already said, uh, or says, you're critical towards this technology. And I would like to ask you now, I mean, I'm always coming back to weighing benefits and, and um, disadvantages. So usually the alternative in many countries with the application of pesticides, why is this actually better than gene drives? Well, pesticides are of course harmful for nature and for the diversity of species, but to compare it uh, I mean, I think it's not possible to compare both things because gene drives are completely different, a completely different um, mechanism that is applied on nature. So usually the argument is that with gene drives, this is just a minor change of, the, or minor change in the genes of an organism, which is not harmful to the organism itself, but in the end, it is about the, the issue that we, we as uh, human beings or as scientists can no, not foresee what this genetic change will do to the organism at the genetic level, but also at the behavioral level of the whole species. And we cannot predict the changes in the interactions in the ecosystem due to this uh, genetic uh, change. And if you, for example, eradicate a whole species, which is the completely new thing about this kind of technology, that uh, we have a tool at our hand in order to eradicate whole species or to alter this species, this is at a time, at an existential time of um, the um, extermination of species or endangered species, this is something that we should not apply um, without further consideration. This should not be decided by only a small group of people. Your organization demands a moratorium, a global moratorium for this uh, technology. And you're also doing this ahead of the CBD or with a view to the CBD. So what do you think? How are the chances at this level well, the dream drives, as uh, Ricarda Steinbrecher has mentioned at the beginning, have a global um, spread potential, uh, potential to spread globally. So once released, they can actually spread wherever they can survive and they can cross country borders. And this is a new or more acute situation in terms of genetic engineering. And this is not yet covered by international legislation or the Cartagena Protocol. The fact that um, these organisms can spread without any control and a consent by the affected countries cannot always be um, ensured. And this is why, from our point of view, we need an international debate and also a decision that makes sure that everyone who has given the consent, know about all the different aspects of this technology and uh, how this technology is being applied. And from our point of view, we are not yet at this point. We cannot yet take this specific decision. And this is why we demand a moratorium in order to have more time so that we can have this discussion. We also have to uh, make a technical a risk assessment or impact assessment, and we have to implement certain regulations. Well, such a moratorium has already failed in the CBD. So um, do you think that this might change and why? Well, during the last COP meeting, um, 
of the CBD, there was already a call for a moratorium. This was uh, two years ago in Sharm el Sheikh. And at the time, uh, there was no agreement on a moratorium. Only the, the attendants only agreed on certain precautionary measures and the precautionary measures that might mitigate negative consequences of field tests. But um, we are not demanding this moratorium together with many other international organizations because it's easy to implement, but simply because it's necessary to implement. And of course, a political campaign is not about realistic uh, objectives. And of course, it's going to be difficult and of course, we need a consensus of the global community to achieve it. And there are sufficient international interests or um, interests at stake um, of countries who see this completely different, uh, who have uh, a large um, technological industry in their countries. But nevertheless, we have to decide about, uh, on that. Well, in Germany, this debate is not yet taking place in large circles of society, only experts deal with it. And this might be due to the fact that there is not a real uh, use case yet, but how about the position of the federal government and the EU institutions and also the parliaments uh, with regard to this demand for a moratorium? Um, do they second your demand or are they rather skeptical? Well, the debate is actually still in its infancy. The German federal, or the federal government has not yet published a clear position. However, the federal ministry for the environment has made a statement in 2018 and said, well, as long as negative effects on biodiversity cannot be excluded, um, gene drive organisms should not be released based on the precautionary um, measures or precautionary uh, strategy. The agricultural ministry has not yet made a statement and however we assume that there is a split uh, opinion on that and an open letter by associations from this year has not yet been um, answered but still the European Parliament this year um, made a statement in favor of a global moratorium in the course of a resolution and the member states uh, of the COP at the next CBD should actually vote in favor of such a moratorium. Um, this is what they said. And based on that, the EU Commission and also the EU Environmental Ministers Council should make a statement, which they have not yet done. This is still pending and currently internal preparations are ongoing. And the EU Commission was approached by 78 associations, which called for a gene drive moratorium. However, the Commission replied that they will take into account um, this statement. So it's still um, an ongoing process and it might even be slowed down by the pandemic. So the technology, if I'm right, is not yet uh, or cannot yet be applied or there are no um, uh, attempts to, to use it uh, right now. But if so, when would might that happen? Might it happen? And um, what would it be? Well, I think there are not yet any uh, applications um, for approval for its use. And I think it would not be possible either because the European Commission for Food Safety um, commissioned a study first in order to uh, develop an opinion whether gene drive organisms actually fall under current guidelines for genetic engineering in Germany, uh, sorry, in Europe, we always need an environmental risk assessment 
in terms of genetic engineering and now they will try they want to find out um, how this can be done and as uh, Kata Steinreich has said at the beginning maybe it's impossible to assess the risk over several generations and this um, position or this report will be published in December at the end of this year and an ethics commission the European group on ethics and science and new technologies will also publish a report at the end of the year on basic ethic ideas in terms of genome editing and new technologies so also uh, on, on gene drives so these are also these are all reports that the commission actually will take into account in the development of their um, position. However, this is a process that will surely take several years, which means that um, in Europe for the foreseeable time, uh, this will not be possible. However, um, the situation in Burkina Faso has actually um, a model character or rather, I mean, it has an effect globally and the positioning of EFSA will also have an effect on the uh, on the international level on the CBD and how international guidelines are being drafted and the commission will have to discuss that. Thank you very much, Ms. Imkin. Um, now we have several questions from the audience. Um, so obviously, um, the technology is not yet fully usable but quite interesting and now the debate is open so first of all i would like to ask a question to andreas wolf the question is when public money was not yet possible to eradicate certain diseases why shouldn't we use private funding to achieve this goal we can now hear you Maybe now. I am also asked to speak up a little bit because apparently I cannot be heard so well. So let me try. Generally, it is good that additional funds are being generated for such big tasks of humanity, but my assessment was that, first of all, people hope you spend a lot of money and you can eradicate polio by doing this. And then you don't have to look into this anymore. This is something which normally does not work. So you need more sustainable, more long-term strategies so that you can integrate disease control and management programs into a continuous healthcare and private funds that very often have the perspective to demonstrate very quickly that they can do something successful with this money. They very much focus on specific diseases and they ignore others. This is why vaccination programs are so popular, because with vaccination programs, you can prove very easily that you can save lives, that fewer children die, and this is why they make sense, but they only work. And that was my point. When they are embedded in functioning public healthcare systems. And this presupposes, first of all, that we need to determine who is determining the priorities in the specific countries, in the specific communities. And this is something that you cannot impose from the top, but this is something that you have to work on together. So nothing in general against private funds or private money, because this can also cause a lot of innovation, not only technological innovation, but also social innovation. But it always is a question of how to integrate this. Ali Tapsoba, are you with us? The question is, Somebody would like to know why you speak on behalf of the communities that cooperate with target malaria. What is your relationship with those communities? 
do you come from those communities or where do you have the information from so that you can speak on behalf of those people? That is the question. So first of all, this is an individual legitimacy because the constitution of my country enables me to also take charge of the health care system in my country and assume responsibility. Also, I have a collective responsibility. I am the spokesperson of 40 different civil society organizations in Burkina Faso because I'm speaking on behalf of these different organizations. I am a member of the community, not because I don't because I don't live in the village, it does not mean that I don't know people who live in this village. I have worked there, I know parents, I know other people who have been resident in those villages. So it is on behalf of those collective groups that I am speaking for, on behalf of the community, that is. So this is a multi-tier legitimacy as a representative of organizations, but also with different contacts into the region. Thank you very much, Mr. Chapsoba. And now there is a number of questions that go to Ms. Steinbrecher. More than once, the question was asked, what is the risk, depending on the perspective, that the gene drives will not work, that this is going to be a flop, a failure, just like the traditional genetic engineering, at least for specific targets like draft resilience traits and others that have so far not been implemented. Is this something that you also see for gene drives? Yes, the possibility that this is only a bubble is certainly something we should take into account. Because as I said before, for the gene drives that are based on CRISPR-Cas, there is quite a likelihood for resistance to develop. That it works initially, it drives back something, but then all of a sudden it returns. And then you don't really know exactly what happened, how niches in the ecosystem changed in the meantime. And the way this changes differs completely from a situation where you would not have interfered from the start. And once resilience is generated, this also means that uh, GMOs were already released and how they were then changed or were changing, we do not know, but you cannot maybe reach the goal that you were aiming for. And it's not only a problem that you did not reach the goal, but that you've also caused something negative at the same time. Well, the way I understand the question is whether you can already reach the goal in the lab. Maybe the technology is very complex and at the moment you said it yourself, this only exists for very simple questions, but not for the major challenges that we are facing. So maybe this could be the same, that genetics are so complicated that even if you use very precise scissor techniques, it does not work. Yes. With mice, it only worked a little bit, and with mosquitoes, resistance is generated, but then this is circumvented by using different genes, and then you can also maybe cause completely different species to spread. All of this is very dangerous, and it might really be a big failure at the end of the day. So then I have a question. I don't really know whether Ali Tapsoba or you can answer this question. What exactly? is the modification of the malaria mosquitoes in Burkina Faso. What exactly was done or what is it they are doing? Would you like to answer this, Mr. Chapsoba?
Ah, können Sie hören? Oder dann Can you hear? If not, Miss Steinbrecher might be able to answer. Soll ich die Frage noch mal stellen? Do you want me to repeat the question? No, no, I heard the question. The genetic modification of mosquitoes over here consisted in trying to intervene with sexual genes of the mosquitoes to insert a gene that essentially will create males. So there will be fewer females over time and the mosquitoes with the male sex will be dominant and therefore whenever mosquitoes mate there will be eggs that will not be able to reproduce the species and this will reduce the size of the population of mosquitoes in the long run. Thank you, Ms. Schneibrecher. There are also alternatives in Africa. First of all, we have a biodiversity which also consists of plants that can cure different diseases. And there are many medical drugs against malaria that are using indigenous plants. There are gels, there are other drugs that can be used. So there are indigenous resources that can be used to combat malaria. Also, we need to have good hygiene policies in African countries. And once this is established, malaria will disappear all by itself. Thank you very much for your comments. And maybe also there is an imbalance in research and that could also be seen as a criticism of this. Our time is almost up. And this is why I would like to ask the last question to all the panelists. The question is, der Anwendung einer solchen Technologie womöglich When such a technology is applied, maybe we should differentiate between using it in order to combat pests and maybe also using this in medicine or for breeding or for the conservation of ecosystems by eradicating invasive species. Would you differentiate? Would you say one makes sense and the other doesn't. Maybe you, Ari Tapsaba, you would like to answer briefly. And after that, Ms. Steinbrecher. I think I did not really understand the question. Uh, you want to know whether there are methods to conserve or maintain species? Bewertet. The question is whether you should assess the technology differently depending on where you use it, whether you use it in order to combat the spread of pests or whether you want to eradicate specific species. Does it make sense in one context and it doesn't make sense in the other? Or do you think it is generally a problem? For us, we cannot accept any aspect of this technology, be it in order to eradicate species or be it to cure diseases. The technology itself is something that is worth criticism and it is sufficiently dangerous. You know very well that the eradication of species can also lead to a perturbation of the food chains. Genetic modifications can lead to species which become uncontrollable in nature. And you also know that there are toxins that are inserted into species, and this can then lead to genetic mutations in the food chain. So 
this technology does not make sense and we can never agree with this. Is there anyone else who would like to take the floor, Ms. Steinbrecher or other panelists, especially whether it makes sense for nature conservation purposes, especially bearing in mind the dramatic crises that we're faced with. Well, it is actually quite interesting that this is always kind of served in different blocks and people are always saying that this is kind of a benefit. And at the end of the day, risk assessment doesn't have to consider the use of this. We have to look at the animals or the organisms. How are they embedded in the ecosystems? What are the risks? What can go wrong? Do we know enough about the risks and what is going to happen in a hundred generations from now? Or maybe it might work a little bit and then it will reverse again. So it does not really matter which area we're looking at for this. We shouldn't really look at the use first, but we should assess the risk correctly. And after that, we can also look at the use cases. But for the use analysis, this doesn't really exist because very often people are just um, really just so enthusiastic about this and they have the illusion that you could do something with it. But the question is whether this is right. So we need an analysis for this first and we need to find out whether this is the right method. And I do question this. Ms. Imken, would you like to comment? Yes. Um, Stop to drive for the campaign. Let me say that from the campaign, there is no easy answer to this. We call upon stakeholders for having a comprehensive participation and discussion of the public opinion. And as a basis for this, we need to have a technology assessment. It does not only have to look into ecological risks, but also health risks and socioeconomic ethics as well as ethical issues and possible alternatives as well as their costs and benefits pros and cons so that we can really shape an informed opinion and we have not yet reached that point but this is something which is being discussed in different places for instance whether this should exist at the CBD level and for the next conference of parties, this might be decided and we need a lot of efforts so that this is going to happen. That would be a good next step. And also, let me say, as a last remark, for every application, we should wait until this technology assessment has happened. And you cannot just say, let's do the technology assessment. And in the meantime, let's test the technology. And as you said, this is not possible in Europe, but this is possible in other countries. This is why I think this might be a bit of a kickoff for the big debate that fortunately has a little bit of time in the run up to the CBD, which might even extend over and above our small circle of people on the internet because at the moment this technology is still at a very early stage and this discussion is something that could still be organized and this is why i would like to thank everyone our time unfortunately is up so first and foremost let me thank the panelists for their very important contributions but let me also thank the audience for the very intelligent and smart questions and the patient interest. Uh, thank you very much also to the interpreters and to the technology, because it is very often a bit of a miracle that it is possible to communicate from Burkina Faso to Oxford via Berlin and that everybody can get involved. Thank you also to the organizers to the Heinrich Böhr Foundation that have enabled all of this. And on behalf of the Heinrich Böhr Foundation, let me also point to the next event. On the 29th of October, there will be a meeting on digital sequence information. So genetic information that is available as a digital sequence. And the question is, who owns this? Who can benefit from its use? This is a topic that is also discussed in the context of the CBD. And on the 18th of November, there is the last meeting on the so-called nature-based solutions.
for the sustainable use and cultivation of nature in order to combat ecological challenges like climate change. And all of them sound very natural, but very often they are controversial and have a lot of consequences. So this is going to be an interesting meeting as well. Thank you one more time. And I would like to wish you all a nice rest of the evening and maybe see you again in two weeks from now. Goodbye.